Okay, so let's go ahead and kick things off. So once again, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, how to build a nonprofit mobile app to engage supporters. So from fundraising, engaging volunteers, or executing a unique event experience, today you're going to learn how apps can transform your nonprofit's marketing strategy. And we have a really great team here with us today who's going to walk you through that. So once again, as we're getting settled in, share in the chat where you're joining in from and what is your superpower? All right, let's move on and cover some housekeeping. So you probably noticed your line is muted, but you can still ask questions at any time by heading on over to the Q&A icon of your Zoom menu. There is where you wanna drop your questions. And you can share comments in the chat. It's kind of like our little water cooler. So if something's really resonating with you or you wanna to add to something that one of our presenters just said, go ahead, type it in chat. Or if you've got a really cool resource too you wanna to share, drop it in there. Um, our chat always ends up being really lively and being a really great place to find additional resources from your nonprofit peers. You're gonna receive an email with this presentation. So if there's something you want to spend a little more time with content wise, cause I know there's gonna be a lot of juicy content here today, then no worries you can go back and um, find those materials in an email that we're going to send to you within the next couple business days. So in that email, you'll get a recording of this webinar and you're going to get the slides and then any links, resources, things that we mention will also be included in that email. And we love it when you tweet at us. We're at TechSoup and then um, our presenters are from TAP Network and we've got those handles there. So go ahead and tweet at us some great lessons, learnings uh, that you're acquiring along the way and use the hashtag TSWebinar. Okay, with that out of the way, a little bit about TechSoup. So we're a global network and we bridge tech solutions and services for good. You might know TechSoup because of our um, nonprofit marketplace. So this includes, you know, our discounted or free software program, um, but we do much more than that. We also provide hardware. We do trainings um, and courses, webinars like this one that you're in today, and we provide that kind of support to our community and more to help over 1 million nonprofits around the world. And that's 200 countries and territories that we currently serve. And we absolutely love to be your resource partner. And to help make that possible are some of these corporate donors that are listed here today and the ones that are listed in our nonprofit tech marketplace. So they've chosen the TechSoup platform to create and grow impactful in-kind donation programs that you get to access. So these are just some of the partners that we work with and some of the uh, products and services that you can find on our website. So um, you can check out all the great offerings from our partners by visiting our nonprofit tech marketplace. And I'm going to include a link to that in oops, the chat. So there you have it. And real quick, I'm just gonna read. Um, some of our uh, attendees today. So we've got friends from Palm Desert, California, and Andrea says her superpower is multitasking. We've got Andrew and his superpower is managing 365 and Azure resources. All right. We have Adam from Denver saying he can listen to podcasts on three times speed. <laughs> That's a rock and superpower. I'm sure your brain is filled with great information as a result. Um, and one more, we've got Rhonda from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and superpowers include delegation and encouragement. Cool, all right, we've got a great crew with us here today and we're gonna get to our presenters in just a bit, but since we're talking about apps, want to make sure you know about Caravan Studios. It's a division of TechSoup and it builds apps, our team there builds apps that helps communities to organize, access, and apply resources to their most pressing problems. And apps from Caravan Studios are designed to meet specific needs by nonprofits and communities. And it's a design thinking process that happens with the team from Caravan, the community, and the nonprofit um, who wants to work on developing a solution. So I'm going to include a link where you can learn more about Caravan Studios and the work that is done there and specifically call out um, one app that has come out of Caravan Studios called Range. And Range identifies the time and location for free summertime meals for kids. 
apps currently in development uh, address additional needs identified by nonprofits, such as managing volunteer deployment and finding um, shelter for survivors of domestic violence. So Rangers is one example. You can check out other apps that Caravan has made, um, but it's a really cool process in design thinking to work with the community and to work with the nonprofit and Caravan to create a solution that um, the community needs. So just a little bit about that, and we're going to get more deep into the world of apps for nonprofits. And at this point, I'm going to introduce the TAP network team who is here today. So at TechSoup, we rely on TAP for a lot, specifically for marketing support like email marketing, landing page development, and much more. And what's so great about them is that they work with a lot of other mission-driven organizations like ourselves, and they provide digital marketing and social media services that are needed to, develop, to deliver compelling content at the right time, on the right channels, to the right audience, right? We know those things are so important. TAP team is a pro, and we're so happy to be partners with them. Um, specifically today, and you'll see in your video, we've got Kyle Barkins joining us. He's co-founder of TAP Network. Joe Giovanni, he's also co-founder of TAP. We've got Whit Godin. Um, Godin, I, I feel like I'm already messing it up and we talk all the time, Whit. You're gonna correct me and make sure I get it right for like the fifth time. Whit is Director of Strategic Marketing at TAP and then myself here, I'll be assisting you via chat and looking at your questions and making sure we've got some time to answer your questions um, at the end of today's session. So with that, I am so pleased to turn it over to the TAP team who is going to talk about um, what they, more about what they do and then dive into how you can take advantage of building nonprofit apps for your org. So take it away, guys. Uh, thanks so much, Nicole. Do you mind just giving, <coughs> closing your um, screen share so I can pop mine up there? Thank you, you so much. It. Sweet. All right. Kyle, take us away. Yeah, great. Thanks for that great intro, Nicole. Uh, and hi, everyone. Um, as she mentioned, we're the founders of TAP Network. Uh, we are TechSoup's marketing technology partner. We strive to empower organizations for good. Um, essentially, we say your vision is our mission. And we're speaking to you today, today um, about you know, making the choice to build a mobile app or a adapt your current website to a mobile app will kind of go through a lot of, you know, how that could be impactful for your organization, um, when to make that move, you know, what it would take if you want to do it internally, or if you look at like outsourcing it and giving you some different options. Um, so I'll turn this over to Wit so you can give you a little bit of background on mobile apps and how they can fit within your organization. Sweet. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. So before we get started, um, I thought it would be pertinent to sort of take a look at some key statistics that kind of showcase some of the important factors that applications um, have within the modern world today. So a uh, fun fact that I discovered when doing some research um, in general is, I don't know if we realize this, it makes me feel old, that the app as we know it today turned 10 years old in 2018. So we're 12 years into a mobile app um, sort of community and, and world. So uh, these numbers may be surprising to some of you. Um, I was definitely surprised. So um, according to a Pew Research survey released back in 2019, um, it, was, it was shown that 81% of Americans actually own a smartphone. Um, <clears throat> and also it's been reported that up to 500 million people access just the Apple App Store every single day. And between Google Play and the iOS, that's the Apple App Store, there are about 105 billion apps that were donated, that were downloaded in 2019. So, you know, given the fact that we are in our, our modern day world, we've just come through a fairly um, intense shelter in place and shift into a lot of new digital uh, communication strategy. The question is, does your nonprofit need an app in order to compete in today's world? So in order to help you answer that question, we have some questions for you. Um, if you answer yes to one or more of these questions, then you might want to consider launching an app for your nonprofit. So I'll just read through these very 
fairly quickly and just take note mentally. If you say yes to one of them, I suggest pull out that pen and paper um, and start taking notes through the rest of this uh, presentation today because hopefully you'll have some great to do's uh, in, the, in the months to come. So the first question, do you want to engage with your community funders and constituents on a regular basis? Do you want to make special resources available to your members and or supporters? Do you want to engage them more rapidly and more interactively? Do you want to alert them through text and a moment's notice? Do you want them to support you with just the click of an icon on their mobile device? Or do you want them to interact amongst themselves in a secure environment? So if you answered yes, like I said, grab a pen and paper. Um, I think this is gonna be a lot of information, a lot of stuff to follow up on. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna pass the torch around the table today. I'm gonna kick it over to Joe, sort of outline some of the key, uh, key benefits of a mobile app for your nonprofit. Great, thanks Whit. So these are all phenomenal uh, reasons that you would want an app. And then it's almost time to take the electric Kool-Aid app test to really see if, if you're ready for an app. And there's about six different things that we look at before we make that decision. Um, one is, will your app solve a problem? So some mobile apps seem like a solution in search of a problem. If your app doesn't offer any additional functionality or convenience to your website or for your users, it will likely struggle, struggle to gain traction with consumers. So think of the pain points that your members or funders may face and how an app can resolve them, because we're out to solve problems. And if you think about it, those of you who have ever had to stand in line at the bank and deposit a check, for example, and then you thought it was magic the first time you could do it from your phone. You want that same wow factor when someone can interact with your nonprofit and they can do it more effectively and more efficiently. The next question we always ask uh, clients is, is, is your website optimized for mobile? So before you consider developing a mobile app, it's a good idea to take stock of how your nonprofit's website performs on mobile devices. So responsive web design or mobile responsive uh, websites can greatly improve the user experience on the mobile device. And responsive web themes are easily uh, available on popular platforms like WordPress and Shopify and Wix. So despite this fact, many nonprofits don't employ a mobile-friendly website. And if you're one of them, you might want to consider upgrading your website so it's mobile responsive before you devote uh, your time and attention to developing an app. Take that first step. And then the next thing is, do you need an app that uses the functionality of a mobile device? So if the mobile device is mobile responsive, apps that utilize functions of a mobile device, such as a camera or accelerometer, are particularly popular with nonprofit uh, users of apps. These offer a user experience that a website can't match. Compelling examples are the wildly popular Map My Run or My Fitness Pal or gaming apps, where you're using the um, the app to actually, it knows where you are in terms of geography and the when you move the app, it can do certain things. So that's one thing to consider. And then also think about, do your competitors have apps? So when evaluating whether or not your nonprofit should develop an app, it makes sense to examine what your competitors are doing. Do they currently have an app? If so, check the statistics available from the relevant app stores see if people are downloading them look at user reviews what may be missing from their app what they love about the app so take that into consideration and look at what your competition is doing uh, and does does retaining customer data simplify conversions what that means is if one, one major reason why mobile commerce sales conversion rates still lag significantly behind the desktop is the clumsiness of inputting the information, such as billing or shipping or donating or volunteering. So if you could automate a lot of that through the app and it's all the information is right there, it makes life much easier for them and for you to execute any types of campaigns through the app. And then finally, do, your, do you utilize user-generated content for marketing and fundraising purposes? So consider building functionality that allows your customers to share content, such as photos and videos, 
featuring your content and fundraising opportunities across all the social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. And what's, what's great about an app is that you are relying on um, consumer generated or user generated content. All that content is right there at their fingertips and they can utilize it that way. So to summarize, take a look at these six, these six questions and, and see where you fall and what, what's really gonna help expedite your decision to, to get an app. So the key here, we're going to work explore different types of apps. And the key here is that we want to drive home is to evaluate exactly what type of app your nonprofit needs. So first we'll explore the different types of apps out there, providing some great case study examples, and then we'll guide you through the decision making process and what tools are out there for your nonprofit to build its very own special app. So let's get started. The, uh, we're going to go over, Kyle's going to go over three types of apps, a native hybrid and web app. I'm not gonna steal its funder. A, a native app that's on the app store. A hybrid app is a combination of what you can get in a, in a mobile web app and a native app. And a, and a web app is more along the lines of their websites that act like apps, but there's so much more functionality and features and benefits that we'll go into those in more detail. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, as Joe. As Joe mentioned, we're going to talk about the three different types of apps um, so you can sort of make the best decision as you move forward. Um, there's not really specifically a one size fits all. You'll see a lot of different options out there. So we'll give you some, some insight into each one today. Um, native apps are going to be the probably most feature rich. Um, oftentimes they might be the most expensive to build and um, maintain over time. You're going to need to find someone um, or a group uh, that is going to be able to develop um, on the code that's needed for that specific platform. So um, you're going to need an iOS or you know an, um, an Apple developer for one, and you'll need a Google or Android developer for the other. And then if you want to put it on different platforms, you'll need to maintain that code in different places. But um, there's some upsides to this. They're really specific to that platform, so sometimes they work better for that different specific platform. So it might work better on an Apple phone be able to take advantage um, immediately or early on with new updates as they come out. Um, and they can work, you know, directly with piece things on your device. So think of, you know, if your organization needs to tap into something like GPS um, or speed, um, things of that nature, that then a native app might be a good solution for you. So when you think of native apps, typically, um, this was the traditional way of building, building applications. And then and it's sort of evolved from there, but there are still many, Companies, app makers, you know, Facebooks, the um, Snapchats, things that uh, in that realm that build specific to the devices because they need to inter interact with that smartphone's processor, all of the the tools that are available um, in the latest releases. So they're not dependent on you know like a third party platform um, for building or maintaining that app. The next type we'll talk through are called hybrid apps. Um, these are going to be a combination of um, what's called a progressive web app um, and oftentimes, you know, a uh, HTML driven browser. Um, these are also installable. All, all the ones we'll talk through besides maybe the mobile web app um, are actually installable. You'll be able to download these in the app store. Um, there are different steps you might need to take depending on how you build it or who builds it for you to get it into the app store. Um, so you'll be able to leverage the things in those app stores, such as, you know, reviews, ratings. This definitely helped from a marketing standpoint to push it out there and say, you know, download my app, you know, get it in the Apple app store. You'll see these oftentimes on websites, on Facebook pages. Um, and you can share these, you know, like in a, um, you know, a text message or, or an email pretty easily from your phone. So great for sharing purposes. Um, this is probably one of the most popular ways to build an app. And we'll talk about some of this in, in depth as well. Um, you'll see a lot of nonprofit organizations um, do this because what they can do is build a website, maintain that website, and then um, package it up as an app. So there's different applications and tools that allow you to do this um, where you kind of take what's there. Maybe it's just recent blog posts or stories on the website, package that up and develop it and push that out to the app store and then take advantage of, of some of the things that are common um, across those different devices. So with a hybrid app, there's usually 
a layer that sits between your website and um, the user's device that allow it creates um, sort of a, a handshake, so to speak, between the device and your website. And then it leverages um, device code through what's called an API um, and a SDK, a software development kit, to display all that, that stuff on the website on, on your phone. So you won't see like a browser bar, um, but you're actually using a web browser. Um, you'll be able to usually by paying for a service, um, you can use things like push notifications, just like you would if you developed a native app. Uh, and, and to the end user, it won't look any different than if you had built the native app. Um, but you're you're at the mercy of you know that maintained um, third party platform, so to speak. Um, th like I said, this is this is more of like a quick launch option, and you don't the upsides here are sort of you know you don't have to you can maintain one code base and push it out to you know the different app stores on the different devices. Um, there's benefits here because that you know third party that you work with will often will keep their code up to date so that when there's new major releases for like ios or for android um, you'll get to benefit from those and then you won't have to make any strong changes on the back end but the downside again is you're limited to what the features are that are built in or that they've made available so you're not going to have all of the um the features at your fingertips typically that you would if you had built specific to each device And then last are the web apps. Um, so these just act and look and feel like um, the native apps, just like a hybrid app or something like that might work, but these are completely browser based. So the hybrid app would be able to take advantage of things like on device data storage, um, possibly pull up like photos from your photo library pretty quickly and easily. They're gonna be able to um, send you, easily send you push notifications, um, interact with your device in that way. You can do a lot of like authentic authentication and security through a hybrid app. A web app is going to be basically packaged as a browser. Web apps often, you know, through different platforms will also allow you to push that into the um, into app stores in some cases, but in many cases, this is going to not go through the app store. You're going to get get like a pop up on your browser when someone's browsing your website from their mobile phone or shared link and say, you know, install this on your device. It'll show up on their home screen you'll see it as like a clickable icon. Um, so it looks like, but, but all that really does is bookmarks that page. Um, these two use some sort of third party system typically or another technology to render that on your phone. So you are gonna see this um, just like you would any other web page, but it's gonna also slice out the browser bar. It's gonna slice out um, anything that would make it look like you were browsing it in like Safari or Google Chrome. What it doesn't do that the hybrid apps and the native apps do, it's not going to add like device specific um, navigation, search bars, things like that. So you're not going to have as much flexibility oftentimes um, like you would in the other apps. And then unlike those other apps, you are, are going to have to be um, connected to the internet because you are using the browser. Awesome. Great, Kyle. Awesome. Yeah, sorry, jumped in on you. <laughs> uh, no, that was a, <clears throat> a really nice sort of way to look at these three different options that you all have available uh, as you explore the different reasons and functionalities that you're looking for when building out your nonprofit's app. Uh, so we, we wanted to kind of look through three case studies and kind of hone in on some of the functionalities and the benefits of those functionalities and how these organizations have been able to leverage the like in the palm of the user's hand um, ease of access to really uh, drive some of those like the key um, takeaways for today's uh, webinar. And the, the first one um, is actually the Red Cross app. Um, and I was exploring this one um, and I was just blown away by a couple of the, the features that they've been able to build in here that really harness the ability to engage. So um, as you can see here on the home page, there's an easy and quick way for, for the user to create an appointment on the left there. And, you know, fun story, I actually, when I was playing around with this app to sort of get a feel for it and how it worked, you know, I started to create an appointment and I didn't complete it. And I want to say maybe 20 minutes later, my Apple Watch dinged, dinged me and said, 
hey, you didn't complete your appointment. Um, and it reminded me to actually go back into the app and complete to complete making my appointment. So talk about follow up um, and ensuring that you're really engaging and, and using your apps platform as, as a way to to kind of in, inspire action. Uh, the next feature that I found absolutely awesome um, is this the badges system. So uh, for those of you who have been on previous webinars with me, you may know that my previous career I was in gaming. So anytime gamification is used, I absolutely nerd out. Um, so they've developed this really awesome badge system that kind of motivates and engages members to continue to participate in donations. Um, and then lastly, you know, they have a great feature built right into the app for your ability to create or join a team. Um, this is a great way to get your organization's and your nonprofit's mission to other people. And just a one click away from me being able to say, hey, this is important to me. Let me invite my friends on this journey um, and help amplify the work that, they're, that the Red Cross is doing as far as um, you know, raising donations and doing blood drives and things like that. So I thought this was a really great example of engaging users. <clears throat> um, so uh, take a look at some of these features when you're thinking about what your nonprofit needs and, uh, and you know, get creative. Uh, I love the badge, the badge system. I think it's really, really cool. Anytime we can gamify something, I think it's definitely a plus win. Um, so I'm gonna let Joe talk a little bit about the American Heart Association, something near and dear to his heart, literally. <laughs> Great, thanks Whit. Um, the, the Heart Association, they take a real unique approach. A lot of, you know, like we talked about earlier, what's the problem you're trying to solve? So the Heart, heart Association, they generate most of their awareness and, and income or revenue through uh, a heart walks. And each city and state has their own heart walk and they created an app that each one of their branches can leverage and use to really drive that. So the app isn't really educational about the Heart Association. A lot of that's on the website. This is specifically to help support this one major annual event that they do. And it's really intuitive. I, I love this app. Um, and I'll just go left to right here. But here you have a dashboard. Dashboards are super helpful. Um, for individual funders or for teams, and it helps motivate people to really hit, hit and set their goals with alerts and everything like that. Heartwalk does a great job there. In addition, um, they build in gamification on the next uh, block here where it says get active. So you can start monitoring your steps, looking at everybody on your team, and that can really help drive fundraising and awareness. And at the same time, as, as per their mission, get people healthy so they do get active. And then there's a lot that's about personalization on here. So if you're raising money for your nonprofit, we all know that the more personalized each person can make their story, the more fundraising capability that they're gonna have. And so we can create a story for TAP's team on the American Heart Association about why we're passionate about the cause, but then each individual member and captain can create their own page and story. So when they're reaching out to people that they know specifically who can relate to the reason that you're raising that money, maybe it's because of a relative or a loved one that has had a heart condition, um, you can really personalize the story. And the neat thing here is you can update and push all that right in the social media onto your Facebook page, and all this is connected. And then finally, what they do is they make it very easy for you to, to donate. The hardest part when, to do when, you're, when someone's trying to raise money is to ask for money. So they have all these different pre-canned personalizable emails or social media posts that you can send. You, and they sync, this is the last block here, they sync right into your contact database. You can pick 10 people, hit join the fight against COVID where Heart Association is doing COVID research that email goes out and all the copies right there, you can personalize it. So love this app, all these pieces work together. And what I like about the Heart Association too, even though that this app is very intuitive, what they do is they also have people who are, who are trainers or guides. And if they have a, a large corporation or a very influential person that's raising money, they'll coach them through the app, they'll coach their teams through the app. And, and that really will do a big boost too. So hope that helps, but I think 
if, if a good idea would be to download the Heart Associations app on, in the App Store and you don't have to donate, but just run through it and get, get a feel for the features and, and see which ones might make sense for you. And the, so the last case study we have, this is a fairly simple, but I think uh, a great opportunity to, to look at how something simple can be very engaging to users. And this is a Boys and Girls Club based out of Indiana um, that has made access directly through the, their users and their members' mobile device to stay on top of all of the game schedules. Um, they also have messaging features and push notification features, um, in addition to also having social media integration right there within the app. So, you know, we looked at the last two, those were pretty robust and complex uh, applications, but there's still some value to be had in something very simple and sweet that really reaches your members and your constituents with the information that they they truly need and what they really, really want. So um, I hope that the case studies we've laid out here have been um, started to maybe flex some of your creative muscles as you're thinking about how your organization might utilize an application. Um, so definitely take a look at all three of those in the App Store. Um, and we're going to move forward and kind of get to the fun part, which is building your own app. So you know, Kyle mentioned, you know, hiring developers and some of those things are, can be fairly expensive, but um, there's also some really great tools out there that can get your, you can get your feet wet with building some applications. But, you know, we've said this once, we'll say it again, it's really important to really understand of like, what do you need in your application? How is it going to serve your nonprofit? And that will help you determine what type of app you might need to make or, or spend the time and the resources for. So thinking about the three different types, you know, are you looking for an application that, you know, your users have quick access to your website and basically the full functionality of your website is everything that you need. There's no additional functions, tools, um, integrations that are going to be necessary and you think that everything that your website has to offer is everything that your user needs, then, you know, investing in a web app is probably the best option for you. Um, but, you know, as, as Kyle mentioned when discussing the hybrid app, are there some enhanced functionalities on top of your website or pulling out specific features from your website that you might want to have for your application, then, you know, you might be looking at wanting to build or needing to build a hybrid app. Um, and then lastly, if, if you're looking for doing something, a complete separate set or separate app and a full feature set, something along the lines that, you know, the Heartwalk has um, really specific, uh, then you may want to invest in building your own app. So we're going to walk through a couple options for you guys uh, to, to kind of get, like I said, get your feet wet. Uh, these are some really great tools and platforms that you can start to, to test out and see, you know, how how it can work for your organization. So I'm gonna ha hand it over to Kyle to talk a little bit about how to convert your website specifically into an app. Great, thanks Whit. And I'll, I'm just gonna echo some of some of his points and I know we'll cover this a little bit as we go through here, but um, if you start to think backwards, um, some better examples, you know, what you can do when you have to build your own app. So if you're like looking at taking advantage of like Apple's CarPlay, for example, you're gonna probably wanna build a native app. Um, but if you, you know, you don't have the type of, uh, of app that's going to need to do anything in the car, you know, play podcasts or things of that nature, then, um, and you just need to press, get, get some of your um, content out as quickly or create some stickiness, that's when we're really going to be interested in converting your website to an app. So we've got a couple of options here today for how to do that. I'm listed on this screen and there's a bunch like this. These are kind of some of more of the, what I'll call sort of best in breed um, that we would, we would recommend. So for WordPress, which we, we know a lot of nonprofits um, are on WordPress, um, one of the values of that is that it has a pretty structured data backend. Um, so there are developers that have built systems like MobileLoud, um, AppMaker, and AppPressor. Uh, the links are, are, are shown here as well to, to dive a little bit deeper, which will essentially take your uh, WordPress website and convert it right to an app. Some of these uh, will take the hybrid app approach uh, where it will bundle things up and actually allow you to use their system to select the features and functionality that you want that might not already exist in your WordPress platform. So mobile odd, for example, has a, 
sort of an app builder, so to speak, where you can um, create and configure on device menus. So uh, kind of a quick, quick menu, as you can see that at the bottom, um, it's shown on those screenshots. So you might have like four or five uh, icons you want people to navigate to quickly, or you want to block off the other menu on your, your website as it is. Um, but it'll pull that stuff right through and, and allow you to present that right to the page. Other sites like App Presser and um, App Maker have some different different features in them as well. So you might be you might have a website that uh, you just want to show recent news and recent and upcoming events, um, and then maybe like a listing of donations. You'd be able to make those configurations in there. And then there's other sites. Um, there's other platforms like this where you can just basically quote unquote convert your website to an app which will just, as we said, strip out the browsers, the browser bars, but everything else, as long as your site's built mobile, mobile optimized um, or responsive, it'll just take that on. And then, you know, you won't have to maintain really two different systems. With these that are shown here, um, you're going to get a login to a portal. Um, you'll be able to do some configuration. Uh, and typically, you're going to have things like a, a monthly fee associated with, mo with most of these um, that's going to do some some of the maintenance and, and it's just in place to keep the uh, the their software up to date so that your your app stays up to date with all of these you have the option of, of you know putting your app in the app store listing it um, and, and some of these will even have services that will help you do that if you don't have wordpress um, there are some other options out there so uh, there's one called convertify and there's one called go native these do the same basic thing. Um, you're probably you're not going to have as many features as you will are the, for the ones that are built specifically for WordPress. You're probably going to strip some of these things out, but with um, some plugins, some tools, some integrations that are available with either of these, you can add some of those features onto it. So things like, like um, push notifications, um, different analytics tools, and tracking would be available. But what you get is the same sort of value proposition. You know, you enter your URL, you pick some general configuration, and then it sort of bundles and packages up your website as it is to an app. Um, you, as we mentioned, you're kind of not limited in some of these cases by what you can restrict people from doing. So whatever's available on your website should essentially be available on this app. It should be available in the app store, but you're not gonna have like the, um, the ability to limit things just to app users. You're not gonna get things like, um, like you like a user database or an app specific user database and in some cases you're not going to get the ability to um, engage with their device any differently than you would if they were just on your website so keep those things in mind as you're making the choice to which one of these is going to be the best fit for you all great <clears throat> and um as far as building your own app there's some really great platforms out there um that you know we've we've seen um, and the first one we're going to cover here is AppyPy. AppyPy recently bought the company AppMaker. And this is a fairly straightforward type of drag and drop uh, platform that would allow you to basically build up your, your own application from the ground up. And um, you can see here on the left-hand side, they've got the whole brand design. You can upload your logo. Um, you can work on your layout, fill out your pages. Um, I just put some examples in here. Um, and then you know you have the opportunity to share the QR code, get that sent out to your team members, have them test it out, and then you know Appy Appy Pie will actually go right ahead and walk you through the process of building and then publishing this app into the Apple App Store and into Google Google Play. Um, similarly to Appy Pie, um, I thought this was a beautiful. I think this is a beautiful um, platform. Uh, very intuitive, very straightforward uh, build fire. Similar to AppyPy, it's a, it's a very user-friendly drag and drop type of platform that allows you to sort of build your, your app from the ground up. Um, and they also have um, the ability to help you guys publish these applications directly into the App Store and Google Play. Um, and you know, these two, I think, are a great place to take a look at. These, they've got some free trials available, so you can kind of test out some of the features as you guys are testing and figuring out exactly what you guys want uh, what your organization needs as far as building out an application platform. Um, but I wanted to, you know, in current times and some some fairly new news out there in the world, like something that's really helpful and, and vital, you know, Kyle pointed out and mentioned earlier, utilizing the App Store and the Google Play um, 
you know, library, your ability to have ratings and have comments and, and have um, reviews is really, really important. Um, and recently, Apple just released a new feature within their app store called the App Clips. Um, and, and I think this is a really important component to uh, the ability to set a first impression um, and make your app pretty discoverable. Uh, so if you guys are interested or you guys are excited about that kind of stuff, you know, we're techies over here. So we get we get jazzed when, when we hear about new stuff like this. But um, App Clips is a great new feature that's going to be implemented in the Apple iOS uh, 14 that are going to be basically allow us to sort of review or preview an app within the app store without having to download it at a sort of a, a deeper level um, and allow you guys, allow app developers to really showcase their app um, and lead with a strong first impression. So I've included the link here for you guys to take a look at the, all the features around app clips. Um, but that sort of ends our informative uh, discussion here. I'm gonna kick it back to Joe so you, um, we can kind of help maybe take you to the next step, take you to the next level. Uh, if you guys get a chance to go and, and play around with some of those platforms and uh, uh, that we've outlined for you there, but hit it off, Joe. Great, thanks, Wit. And we'll, we'll still be on the line here to answer questions. And what, we'll, what we'd love to do too, we have a, a marketing app console uh, offering on TechSoup. It's, it's around, I think it's 49 or $79. But we'll, we, we, uh, we can give you guys a, a free app consultation. So if you go to the uh, inquiry form here and in the notes portion, just mention that you were an attendee of this webinar and we'll, uh, we'll waive that fee and answer any questions that you may have and help you scope out uh, what, what type of app solution might be best and, and the costs and platforms that might be uh, best for you. Great, thanks so much for everybody coming. I'm gonna uh, pull in Nicole here to help kind of dive through some of the questions that came up throughout the webinar. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for that. Lots of solid information there. Um, got some questions if we will be sharing the replay and slides of this webinar and we will be. So you will be getting an email with everything you just heard within a couple business days. Um, and I did just share that inquiry form link for the free app consultation in your chat. So you'll be able to see that. We'll also include it in our follow-up email too. So yes, let's move on to questions. Um, and as this says, it's a great time to ask your questions. Use this team while they're here right now, live in the flesh. Um, so bring those questions in. We're gonna start with one we have here. A question is, um, what advantage is there to a website app and having our website be mobile usable? Who'd like to tackle hey, that Take one? it, Kyle. So what is the advantage to a Sorry. website app? What is, what, or what advantage is there to a website app and having our website be mobile usable? Yeah, that's good. Sorry, I just had to un find my AirPods. Thing. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, all websites, should, all of your websites um, should be mobile usable, mobile optimized. Um, I spent with more than half of visitors coming to websites now from a mobile device um, or being sh or your you know website being shared from text messages, emails that people are reading on mobile devices or Facebook. So it's like dire importance um, to have to make sure your website is mobile optimized. Um, a lot of times that can be sort of similar to what the, the same app experience as we talked about earlier. The value of, of doing it that way is then your website is basically ready. If you want to make it a quote unquote app, you can package it up with one of the systems we talked about or one like it. And then it's available as an app in the app store. One of the advantage of, advantages, some of the advantages of the app store would be marketing, right? So it's available there. Someone's searching for a solution and you have the listing done correctly. So let's say it's, you know, supporting, um, people, you know, let's say people in need, um, or pets in need or something like that. And they want to find a, a local animal shelter or something like that in the app store. Uh, maybe they're looking for one of your competitors or maybe a for-profit, um, that, you know, is nearby. If you, you know, are marketed well and you get good reviews in the app store, you'll appear, you can appear higher in those results and you might get yourself a new constituent, a new volunteer, a new donor. Um, 
having the mobile version of your website or having that website be optimized for mobile also makes it easier. You know, when someone does come to your site, if they are visiting or revisiting the site, you can add a feature that will pop up a little, um, an option on a mobile device to say, you know, download this app. I'm sure anybody visit, you know, visiting different sites has seen, you know, get our app or continue in browser as, an, as a pop-up notification. If you have an app, uh, a mobile or an app version of your site, you can put that on your website or so that anybody visiting from a mobile device sees that as well. So it's another way to create some stickiness. Um, and then once it's there, depending on what you use or how you have that installed or built, um, then you can engage with those people after they've left your, your website. So think about donor engagement, um, how, you know, if you're doing it through email right now or text message or, or, or mail, now you have another um, vertical to, to reach them on. You can reach them right on the device whenever you, you know, whenever you need to. So you can set up like an automation that says, okay, five days after someone's visited our website, send out a push notification to ask if they'd like to come back and donate or, re or volunteer or support. You can also do, you know, time specific notifications. Like if you're hosting an event, you could send a blast out through a device. And, you know, I know mine's attached to my hip um, or usually in my hand. Uh, you know, I'll see that pop up if someone sends me out a push notification, you know, come, come support our, our cause at this event on this day. You're right, right in front of them um, with more, with a better view of viewability than you'll get out of um, email typically or um, traditional mail or phone calls, text messages, things of that nature, because you've got that stickiness there. Great. Thanks for that, Kyle. And you know, I'm just realizing um, the link did not go through. I accidentally sent it to all panelists instead of all panelists and attendees. So sorry about that. And some of the other links I um, sent earlier might not have gone through like um, info about our tech marketplace. No problem. We're going to include that in the post event email. All right, let's move on to our next question here. Um, this question's from Mark and he says, my organization uses Facebook and email to alert members to news or issues that they should be aware of. How can an app do this better or differently? Or different, I would say, different than Facebook or email? Uh, that's sort of, sort of what I was just kind of talking about. So you've created that like um, handshake, it's sort of, personalized. Um, if you're on someone's device, it's a little bit different than being, you know, in their email box and their list of thousands and thousands of contacts and thousands and thousands of connections you would have on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, I don't remember the number what might have it, but I think the average person has something like 30 or 40 some apps installed on their phone. And there's a few that are dormant. Um, but you know, that's much, that's a, a much smaller audience that you have a more captive audience, so to speak, that you have than you would on, on one of those other platforms. So I think, you know, big fish, small pond versus small fish in a big pond. Right. Great. Okay. Let's uh, move things into security. We've got a couple questions that have come up about security of apps. Um, specifically this question, if we were able or if we were to take donations through our app, how secure would it be? The main reason people refuse to donate on Facebook or PayPal is because they don't feel secure. How do you want to respond to that and just issues around security when it comes to apps? Yeah, certainly I can, I'll take that one too, obviously. <laughs> He's the so, technology guru. Yeah, it, I mean, that, that kind of comes in that, Security is always a major concern, um, depending on where you're doing these donations. A lot of times, I know a lot of times the donations are actually not taken through your website. It's just kind of framed in your website and gone and goes through a third party system. Maybe it goes through PayPal. Maybe it goes through um, a donation platform. Um, so you know, make make sure that 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 platform or that service is vetted um, and secure, and they have you know security protocols in place. Then having an SSL. Uh, certificate on your website installed correctly and configured um, is going to be important. So you can create that trust, not just from the user and the browser, but also um, from like search engines to make sure you appear higher. And then those types of technologies can, will port over um, in the hybrid and web app versions in the on device mobile app versions, they will use a very similar um, security protocol. So whoever your developer is or whatever platform you're using, using to develop that app should have that all in place um, and you can you know, run that test test or run those questions by them. I mean, every situation is a little bit different, but you know, having security front of mind is good that someone's thinking that way. Um, but you will have yeah. the security of that you would have the same security or better 
than you would on a website if it's configured correctly. And then you also have some of the added features um, that you would get on something like a mobile device where you have maybe face recognition or a pin you have to put in. So it's sort of like a, a built-in multi-factor authentication, so to speak, that you would get. Um, so the person using the device could confirm that they were that person and then they're using their credit card or Apple Pay or whatever it might be that's available um, to donate or um, put money through to your organization. Thanks. Yeah, I think that um, takes care of a lot of the questions around just user security, um, certainly for donors who want to donate through this app. So yeah, thanks for those questions. If there are any other security questions, let us know and yeah, we'll team will do their best to answer. And I also dropped in the email address for CAP Network and how you can follow up with them if you've got more questions. It's in chat. Uh, it's techsoup at tapnetwork.com. So we've got time for a few more questions here. Let's move to this question here um, from Jorge. For language accessibility, would we have to build out separate apps for different languages or are there some kind of translation features that can be embedded in the apps? Take it, Kyle. <laughs> You're the man. So this is kind of, this is for sure um, one of the items that would you know that you would want to think about when you're looking at um, building a native app versus taking advantage of one of the, like the SDKs or the other the platforms that allow you to to convert your website to an app. If you're building a native app, you're gonna have to build those tools and functionality in, um, or take advantage of something that exists. So your developers gonna have to do that. A lot of times, there's something like that, like a translation plugin. Um, or you know any anything like anything of that nature, like uh, push notifications, um, payments that would be available that would be that that app like middle layer would have avail would have available to you out of the box, so to speak. Again, also um, depending on what type what which way you go with this, you might have that built into your website. So if it just packages the mobile website or as a mobile app, your website's just packaged as a mobile app, um, you'll still be able to take advantage of all the tools you have built into your website. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great question. And especially uh, our nonprofit community working with lots of different communities uh, with different language needs. That's a really important aspect we want to consider in our mobile builds. Great. Okay, I really like this next question here. I think it um, encapsulates a lot of TAP, what you guys are experts in, and really reinforces the content from today. So the question is, um, we are a small organization and a mobile friendly, mobile friendly WordPress site, uh, which type, either native, hybrid, or web apps, would be suitable to engage community members, volunteers, or potential donors, given our limited tech experience? So which type would be best suited given limited tech experience? What would your advice be there? I'd say I would just go with um, the hybrid, like the hybrid or the web app version. Um, if it's on a, a WordPress site, and you said we can, you can take advantage of the hybrid apps that we shared on the hybrid style apps that we shared on here. If you want um, more functionality or less functionality, that's a little bit more specific. Um, or if you're just, if you're okay with how your site is now and you want to be able to engage um, better on mobile, uh, like a, a more like an owned experience and have a, 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 a uh, like a packaged mobile app, so to speak, then I would, you could just go with the web app approach. The web apps, a lot of times, those those are um, you know there's services that's like a one-time fee, um, then it's then it's set up, and then you would just need to pay for updates. The hybrid services are typically a monthly fee that you'll pay. On that way, you get the latest you know supports and releases. So, as Whit mentioned, like app clips, app clips should be available if it's not already uh, in many of those platforms because they've you know their software developers have been developing to keep up for this. So when there's a new release in iOS, you'll have access to it, but you're paying, you're basically paying that service software as a service fee um, to have access to that. And if I could just add on really quickly, um, I think if any of you guys have been to our, as an agency, we look at our website development um, through what we call like a growth driven design perspective. And we, you know, you want to get launch critical, this idea of like building the initial um, core functionality of your website and then growing your website based off of data and metrics 
so that when you grow and you add on to what you're currently offering, you're doing so now with a knowledge base of what your users are looking for. So, you know, if you've got a really beautiful WordPress application or WordPress website, I think starting, as Kyle mentioned, starting on that sort of the hybrid or web app side of things, seeing what functions, functionalities are working, what aren't, what isn't necessarily getting the conversions and or the traction that you're looking for, then you can make some really educated decisions on how you might decide to continue to grow into a more robust hybrid app platform and or even investing some time and budget into a full native application. But if you have that foundation through a Word, WordPress site, I think the best path forward would be to start off with little baby steps, right? Um, and get the net, get the data points and get the user um, information. So as you put more resources and budget behind some maybe larger projects, you're doing so with the best um, the best intentions and and the most amount of information. Well said, well said. And we're almost at time here, but let's let's try to get to this question briefly, if possible. What sort of budget should one plan for when building an app? And maybe talk briefly too about the um, variation between the three options when it comes to budget. That's a really tough one to pinpoint. Yeah, um, yeah it's very, it's definitely going to be um, situational, specific. Um, if you're happy with your, I'll, I'll go from probably cheapest to most expensive. Um, if you are happy with your website as it is on mobile, um, there's going to be a, a, a pretty small, I, I would say, um, fee for converting it to a web app. Uh, as I said, we can do that kind of one time. I've seen prices that are you know, $19. I've seen prices that are $199. Um, it's going to be dependent upon functionality, speed, and then you know, trustworthiness, I guess, of the, the organization you're working with to do that um, or the, the platform. To make it a hybrid app is going to be a little bit more expensive, as we said, because that it maintains that layer that layer over time. So it's usually a software as a service type solution. Same thing there. Um, I'd say you're probably looking at like fifty dollars, maybe at the minimum at the entry level. Um, for the hybrid app, I will I will. It's worth mentioning um, your your website has to to meet certain criteria. It has to be you know the code has to be clean, it has to be developed a certain way, it has to have mobile. You can't use certain technologies sometimes. Um, like the way that different sites might get rendered might not work with the way that it pa it creates that app um, or renders that on the different devices. So there might be a, there might be more you need from like a a developer to step in and make updates or changes to to conform to that. Um, you can get the hybrid app cost can go way up because you might want to develop functionality specific to to the site or to that hybrid app. Um, so that price is a little bit more variable. The native app is gonna be the most expensive, um, hands down. It's gonna, you're gonna need a developer or developers that develop for that native device. There are sort of middle layer type things, um, like tools that you can take advantage of, like Firebase. I actually saw someone bring up Xamarin um, from Microsoft, which are sort of, or, or like tools you can use and develop in one common code, like C Sharp or .NET or Java and then convert that to an app for both Android and, or actually for Android, Microsoft, or, um, or Apple. So even still though, you're gonna ha you're basically, you're basically maintaining two different code bases there. So the, the value, the benefit of, of converting a website to an app or a hybrid app is going to be, you're still just using your website. You're just kind of managing um, that other layer. If you're building a native app, you're gonna have a website and then you're gonna have a mobile app for um, and you might have a mobile app for Android, might have a mobile app for iPhone, might have one for Microsoft, or you might have a website and then um, a mobile app, and then it's pushed out through one of these services. That's definitely going to be more expensive because you're basically, you're going to be basically duplicating work, if nothing else, at that point. That's helpful. Yeah, and That's if, you helpful just, if you want just, if you want first in the last minute here, if you want just some like, you know, I was in re reference to AppyPy, for instance, you know, if you want your application to be supported and you're building it from the ground up kind of a thing uh, and you want it supported in both Apple and um, Android, you know, you're looking at $60 an app per month. Um, so my suggestion is do some, do some pricing research um, and compare that with the functionalities that you're looking for. But like Kyle said, it, it's, it runs the gamut depending on how, how many um, integrations you're looking for and, and all the functionality that you're needing. But if you're looking for a dollar amount, I can give at least that from their website uh, for you guys.
That's so. helpful. Thank you. Thanks for that. And I know we're at time, um, but I'm glad we covered that question because that's always on our mind. Budget, what can we expect to spend? Um, if you wouldn't mind, Wit, just flipping to the next slide since you're there already instead of me grabbing it back. Just want to wrap with a couple quick things. Um, first of all, we've got a lot of events coming up. I won't get to all of them now, but I just dropped in where you can learn more about all of our past and upcoming events. So head on over to those links. And um, just the last slide there, we've got a link to our survey. Yes, and I'll also drop our survey here. Please take time, just it's a, a minute tops to fill out that survey that really helps us in preparing for future content for you guys so that we can serve you best um, and make sure that you're getting uh, what you need out of these webinars. So thank you so much. Um, and again, I've also included the email address for the TAP team. If you did not get your question answered or have more questions, it is there. Um, TAP team, it's always great having you here. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks yeah. all for coming. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for your great questions. We'll see you around another event. Um, until then, uh, survey link is for date and trainings. Oh, let me, well, when you X out of um, your Zoom webinar, you're going to be redirected to the link. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully you land there. So thank you again and uh, stay safe, be well. We'll see you around. Bye everyone.